1211 was a successful year for Chinggis Khan. Although still inexperienced with taking cities, the Mongols had burned across the Qin Empire before returning to the southern Gobi for rest. With Chinggis away, the Qin reclaimed some territory, but Chinggis' sons occupied them in the west while his great general Jeeb encouraged the uprising of the Khitan in Manchuria. In April, as the Qin dynasty suffered another round of famine, a Khitan named Ye Lu Lu Ke declared independence from the Qin and allied with the Mongols, calling himself king of a new Liao empire. Chinggis spent early 1212 with the Ongud, where some of his supporters had been assassinated. Once matters were settled, Chinggis returned to China in late summer. In October, the Khan converged with his sons at the Qin's western capital, Datong, while his youngest son, Tolui, acted as a screen against Qin relief forces. From Qin defectors and captured engineers, the Mongols were beginning to use catapults and siege technology. However, this campaign was cut short when Chinggis was wounded in the leg by an arrow, and with the bulk of his forces he left China. Tolui too followed his father north, and the Qin closed 1212 by reoccupying some territory. This high note, however, was deceptive for the Qin, for the Mongols knew they could defeat the Qin on the battlefield. Now their cities were no longer secure from the horde. Chinggis Khan returned in spring 1213, and the brief glimmer of hope the Qin may have seen in winter quickly disappeared. While Muhalai took the northern capital of the Qin Empire, Mongol armies dashed back and forth, and Chinggis again directed his attention to the main Qin capital, Chengdu. In late summer, Doxing and Chengdu were taken by Chinggis, and near modern-day Yanqing, he defeated the Qin general Xu Hu Kaoji. The remnants of Xu Hu's force retreated into the Zhuyong Pass, which Jib had taken in 1211 through a feigned retreat. The Qin refused to fall for that trick again, and fortified the north of the pass. Here, the Muslim merchant Jafar came to the Khan's aid. Jafar had long been an associate of Chinggis, present at the Baoshuna government, and often provided him with valuable information. Chinggis left a force to watch the north of Zhu Yongguan, while he and Qi followed Jafar through the mountains, coming out to the south of the pass. In the north, Khitans and Chinese defected to the Mongols, including a catapult specialist and his crew, Hu Talahai, and told them of the weaknesses of Zhu Yong's defenses. The Mongol force attacked the north, while Chinggis struck the Qin in the rear and once more cleared the pass. Meanwhile, traumatic events had occurred in Chengdu. A disgraced general, either Hu Shahu or Chi Chung, the general defeated at Yehu Ling in 1211, returned to Chengdu in September and assassinated the emperor, the Prince of Wei, then put his emperor's nephew on the throne and declared himself regent. The Prince of Wei, despite his faults, had been able to command the various Qin forces across the empire into a semblance of an offensive. Under this military regency, however, the government now focused on survival. The regent, despite an illness, succeeded in driving off two small Mongol forces outside of Chengdu. A third Mongol force defeated Chu Hu Kaoji, who proceeded to murder the regent before he could be punished. By November, Chinggis Khan was just north of Chengdu, and seeing the chaos in the capital, changed his plan. Until then, the Mongols had focused largely on defensive points along the northern border. With his foe weakened, distracted, and unable to coordinate, now was the time for a decisive blow. A massive, multi-pronged offensive was planned, leaving only a small force outside of Chengdu for the winter. The Mongol target would not be cities, but people. Now they focused on speed and mobility, destroying crops, farmland, villages, obliterating morale, and by focusing on softer targets, they built a reputation for invincibility and dread. One force under Chinggis's sons, Juchi, Chakatai, and Ogadai, assaulted Shanxi and Western Hebei, heading to the Ordos Loop and sacking Datong. Chinggis's brother Khazar terrorized the area between Chengdu and the Pohai Sea, then went northeast of the Leao River to encourage the Khitans to maintain their revolt. Muhalai, Chib, and Subutai ravaged eastern Hebei in the Shangtong Peninsula, where they met with Chinggis and Tolui. Here, Chinggis Khan saw the ocean for the first time in his life, then marched south. 
passing close to Ka Feng. This campaign showed a marked improvement in their siege ability. Over 86 towns are said to have fallen, including several cities with populations over 100,000. By the end of winter, the Qin Empire north of the Yellow River had completely transformed. Qin control was lost in large swaths of the country as citizens turned to local armed militia for protection, banditry was rampant, farmland was destroyed and everywhere peasants were terrified for the sudden appearance of Mongol horsemen on the horizon. No one able to predict where they would strike next. Thousands defected to the Mongols, learning that voluntary subjugation brought safety from their wrath giving the Mongols much needed manpower, experience and resources for taking larger settlements. As means to stop these defections, the Qin removed restrictions on Khitans and Han Chinese from high position in the military and bureaucracy. But what incentive was there to fight for an emperor who cowered in Chengdu? By the end of March 1214, Chinggis's armies had reconvened in the capital suburbs. His brothers Tammuz and Khazar were given command of the left wing. While Juchi, Chaghatai, and Urgadai took the right, and Chinggis and Tolui the center. This was the test of everything the Mongols had learned. Thousands of civilians were driven into Chengdu to stretch food and water supplies thin, and a stranglehold was put on the city, starving. Prisoners worked as fodder to fill a path across the moats, while catapults hammered at the walls. Two breakthroughs were made, but both times the Mongols were pushed back. While Chengdu starved, the Mongols suffered as well. Disease spread among them and their horses, and Chinggis wanted a quick end to the siege. His peace overtures in April failed when the emperor refused to give up his title. Annoyed, Chinggis sent Mukhalai to retake Liaodong, put loyal Jafar in charge of negotiations, and himself returned to the Dolanur oasis to await news. By the end of the month, the Qin finally agreed to terms. Thousands of horses, hundreds of slaves, mountains of silk, gold, brocade, and jewels were given to the Mongols, and to Chinggis, a daughter of the Prince of Wei, to marry. While the Mongols apparently agreed to return some territory, it seemed that Chinggis had finally accomplished his dream of humbling the mightiest empire in Asia. Yet in June, the emperor fled Chengdu for his southern capital, Kaifeng. It seems he feared another Mongol attack, and left his heir in command of the city. The Qin generals in Chengdu prepared what they could, knowing that the wrath of the great Khan would be coming for them.